Hey, good morning. Pastor Connor here at 7.30 on May 25th. We're getting ready to pray here in just a minute. Uh, before we do that, hey, I want to take a few minutes just to say thank you for joining me. And for those of you who log on early, before we get to the actual meat of our conversation, I've been uh, sharing different books over the last couple of days. And uh, another little book that I found helpful, and maybe you will as well, um, especially on the topic of anxiety. And that's not what we're talking about today, but kind of here, free book reference for you. This is called Finding Freedom from Anxiety and Worry by Dr. William Backus. Um, this guy's got a lot of great things to say, a variety of other books that I've read. Just a very thoughtful writer, and uh, I think you can appreciate what he has to say. Um, here, I'll just read a quick paragraph out of here, and then we'll get to our conversation for today. He says, no drug will rid our lives of anxiety, no psychotherapy can take it all away, and no religion will cause it to vanish like the morning dew. Anxiety remains a part of life. You have it because you are a human, human being existing between time and eternity, surrounded from cradle to grave with what the ancient prayer describes as so many and so great dangers. I skip down a little farther and he says, the good news about anxiety is that there is a way to deal with it in faith so as to make the most of it, diminish its power, and find your way through it. If you're willing to stop adding to the problem by seeking every which way to escape and avoid anxiety, if you're willing to let your faith become activated and to follow it straight ahead into your fear, you can discover how to ease and reduce anxiety and even use it to become the person God wants you to be. Instead of running away from anxiety, step firmly into it. It's just from the introduction, but a very thoughtful book, Finding Freedom from Anxiety and Worry, uh, I have written a couple of articles on this in newsletters in the past. Uh, if um, you don't get this written down you, later, you say, I'd like to know what that book was, shoot me an email or message me and I'll be happy to share it. But there's your book reference for the day. Okay, so for today, I want to go back to something we started with on Friday in Mark chapter 6 and the feeding of the 5,000. And if you remember back on uh, Friday, we started to read that text, but we actually never got to the feeding portion, because we got to this uh, in uh, the first few verses. Jesus says to his disciples, um, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest or be refreshed for a while. So um, we said we come back to this uh, today, and that's what we're doing. But we aren't even going to get to the miracle even today, because there's another portion of the text that's going to occupy our time. So what we're going to be praying for is that one, we could appreciate and give glory to God for his compassion to us in Christ, and that we would be people of compassion. And maybe also along the way, that we would expand our appreciation of what that word compassion means. And let's, let's just walk through this and see, okay? So Mark narrates this. This is in Mark, this is in Mark chapter 6. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and dot, dot, dot. We'll hold off for a second. Before I read what happened next, I want you to put yourself there. You've been so busy doing ministry that you haven't even had time to eat. That's what Mark tells us. You're trying to get away for a while to, to rest and to be refreshed. And these crowds of people are waiting for you when you get there. Now, what kind of stuff would go through your mind at that moment, all right? Are you really excited to see them? Really? I mean, what type of things would you be tempted to say? I mean, I'd be tempted to say, can you just leave me alone for a few hours? I haven't had a chance to eat. I'm tired. And I'm not in the mood to be swarmed by people. I think all of us would have that thought at least flow through our minds. Okay, but I want you to see what Jesus does here. Here's what Mark narrates. When he, that's Jesus, when he went ashore, he saw a great, he saw great crowds, and he had compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Okay, there's, there's so much in these two little sentences, all right? First, Jesus had compassion on them. 
This is one of my favorite words in scripture, all right? Now get ready, because you're going to love it. You know, forget it after I say it, and you'll say, Pastor Connor, I can't remember that word. But here's the word. Splachnizomai. What a fantastic word. Splachnizomai. I, I just love that word. It comes from the Greek word splachnon, which means bowels or guts. Yeah, really beautiful word, right? But anyway, the splachnon, the, the guts, were viewed as the seat of of love and compassion. I know you think that sounds weird, right? We say in our culture, my heart goes out to you. So we associate love and compassion with the heart. But the Hebrews located it in the guts. And and really, when you are deeply moved over something, over some situation, you don't really actually feel it in your heart. You actually feel it down in your guts. And it feels like those guts are going to come up out your throat and out your mouth. That's what it feels like. Well, that's being moved to compassion. So Jesus sees the crowds like that. I think that's absolutely remarkable. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd, and he's moved in the center of his being to show compassion. But I want you to notice something, all right? He has compassion, and then what does he do? Pay attention to the text. What does he do? Does he feed them? Not yet. He does that a little bit, but not here. Not yet. That comes later. He's moved to show compassion. What does he do? He teaches them. He teaches them. That doesn't mean compassion doesn't involve seeing people's needs and and seeing and helping them in their needs. So John will write about this in 1 John chapter 3, where he says this, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, that word there is actually splachnon. How does God's love abide in him? So literally, what John writes, which our translators are too kind to put, but if anyone sees his brother in need, yet closes up his bowels against him, how does God's love abide in him? John is writing about constipated compassion. Yeah, so you think about that for a while. We're just going to leave that conversation for another time, but that's literally what John is writing about there. So, yes, compassion would certainly involve uh, seeing to people's needs. But I want us to see today that, that God's compassion in Christ, at the very least, involves teaching, teaching about the kingdom, about the redemptive reign of God in Christ. There's a strong temptation in the church to, to downplay teaching today. And this happens, this happens all over the place. It happens in youth ministry because we get so caught up in high-octane activities and fun. And those are good. But it even happens in the, the church's programming and practice, even in worship. We get so caught up in, in uh, the experience and we want to downplay teaching. But I think that that's wrong-headed, at least if I'm listening to what Jesus is doing here. Good teaching is a part of godly compassion. Okay, good teaching is a part of godly compassion. Jesus sees these people as sheep without a shepherd, and he's moved to show them compassion, and he teaches them. Okay, he believes they need good teaching. So good teaching about the reign of heaven is one piece of compassion. We're not saying compassion is only about good teaching but it certainly must be a part of compassion. So the establishing of the pastoral pastoral office, for instance, to preach the word and to administer the sacraments is a piece of God's compassion in action. Now, there's so much to say on this, but Jesus is actually called the splachnon of God in Luke chapter 1, verse 78. That's for another conversation, but he's the incarnation of God's compassion, all right? But for today, I want us to appreciate good teaching about the redemptive reign of heaven as a piece of God's compassion, and then to give God praise for it. And here's the the comforting thing. See, he doesn't want us to be shepherdless. He doesn't want us to be shepherdless. So he sends teachers among us to teach us about the reign of Christ, God's reign in Christ. God has shown us and continues to show us compassion. He calls pastors and church workers, and they are teaching us 
about the reign of heaven. And that's one means, not the only, but one means by which God shows compassion. Splachnidzomai, just a fantastic word. And the other piece of that is that being moved in your, in your guts, right? This is getting to the essence and the core of your being, which tells us that in the essence and core of God's being is a God who's eager to show compassion. And he does that at least in one piece of, of the question of compassion. One piece of it is by sending faithful teachers among us to teach us about the redemptive reign of God in Christ. Okay, let's take a moment to pray. Father of all mercies, God of all comfort, we praise you for your compassion. You have not left us shepherdless, but have sent faithful preachers and teachers into our midst to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, to teach us about your redemptive reign in Jesus. We praise you also for the technology to gather at a distance to hear your word and be nurtured by it. And what comfort, hope, and joy it brings us to know that you are king, that you are reigning, and that in Christ you are making all things new. You have started with us in our baptisms, but you promise it, it, your promise extends even beyond us into the entirety of creation. You're going to make it all new. You're going to refresh it, rejuvenate it, reinvigorate it, and set us to reign with Christ over it. As we consider how we might extend godly compassion in our contexts, let us not overlook faithful teaching on the kingdom. In addition to sharing our worldly goods with those in need, help us to point them to the good news for the world in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for showing us compassion by teaching us about the gospel of the kingdom. Sustain us in our faith and embolden our confession until you return to raise us and renew this earth. We pray these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being a part of uh, uh, prayer time this morning. Uh, just a couple notes about the week. So Thursday, I won't be starting a new Bible study yet. We have a council meeting here at Zion on Thursday, so I can't be two places at once. I haven't figured that out yet. Uh, so we'll, we'll look into the next week before we start our next Bible study. Uh, but I look forward to doing that then. But otherwise, I plan to be back tomorrow morning at 730. And thanks for taking the time to pray with us today. And I encourage you to share this with others. And we'll see you soon.